you applaud now and wait till the end. Um, right, well, it looks as though I'm speaking on a stage designed to hold the Eurovision Song Contests. So uh, I'll try to cover it a bit. Right, so um, this talk is about the application of player type theory. Now, um, it's often called the Bartle types, um, but uh, since I am Bartle, I don't actually call it the Bartle types, I just call it the player types. Like the only person in the world who doesn't call it the Higgs boson is Higgs. Um, so I'm just going to call it um, player types. But if you call it the Bartle types, well, okay, that's great. Unless it goes wrong, then it's back to being player types. Um, I still have plenty of uh, chance to blow my own trumpet, though. So even though I'm not calling it Bartle types, that doesn't mean I'm not conceited. Oh, that's a big bird. Right, now, my aim back in 1996, wherever it was, that I, uh, when I created player types, was to stop designers from making games that they wanted to play and to start making games that people wanted to play. Because back then, if you were a game designer, you created games that you personally wanted to play on the grounds that, well, at least one person's going to play it. But now, um, that's all gone by the by. Uh, because the thing is that people play games for different reasons. And if you're only creating games that you want to play, then they're not going to be attractive to the other people who want to play the games. Um, when I did this, I identified four areas that describe why people play virtual worlds, or MMORPGs as they're known now, or MMOs for short because the acronym's too long. Um, back then they were called MUDs, multi-user dungeons. Um, they were in text, which is a form of symbols that you get on screen. They, they, people can interpret them as meaningful, but they're not quite the same as graphics. Um, the theory still applies to graphics, but it came out of a text world because it's so old. Right, um, I'd known this theory for uh, several years before I actually wrote it up. Um, I put it together in 1990, um, following a, some discussions with the players of my own game, which was called Mud 2, because it was the fourth version of Mud. Um, the players were describing what they liked about the game and what they thought the other people liked about the game. And at the end of all this, I got they were starting to repeat themselves, so I just summarised the whole discussion, and I spotted that there were these commonalities, and the result was a basic player types theory. Um, this says that there are four types of people who play um, virtual worlds, MMOs, for fun. And these are achievers, explorers, socialisers, and killers. So if you've heard of those, that's uh, because that's what I called them. Um, other people do play games, but they don't play them for fun. So, for example, designers play these games mainly for like designer fun, because it's, they like the mechanics and things, not because they actually like the game, but they like the design. Journalists will play the games because they get paid to express their opinions on them, not necessarily for fun. Researchers will play the games so they can write up about how addictive they are or how violent they are or how society is going to collapse as a result of them. Um, oh, that's just this country, though, isn't it? Sorry. Um, in, the, in the UK, they just write them up saying, um, give us some money, we'd like to design these. They're, they're good for education. Um, gold farmers, they play the games not for fun but because they can make money from it. And customer service reps play the games because there are people with whips making them play the games. Um, player types are normally expressed like this as a graph. So we've got the players on the left and the world on the right and interacting and acting at the top. And there's four quadrants and that's where they all go in. And there's this big theory behind them that explains it all. Um, here are the top five features in used cars as requested by European drivers. If you notice in Germany, they all want air conditioning. I'm pretty sure that's to do with the weather. Down here in Spain, look, they want four-wheel drive followed by a sunroof. Whereas in Italy, they want four-wheel drive followed by a navigation system, because you might get lost a lot in Italy. <laughs> anyway, um, the, um, the 2D, 2D graph uh, has been applied successfully to MMOs since Ultima Online, basically, um, unless you count my own MMOs, which I applied it in, but they hadn't been published then. So it's been applied successfully to massively multiplayer games for 15 years. 
Um, it's kind of regarded as the standard. Uh, all the people who work on MMOs know these types because they all got taught it in MMO design school. Um, occasionally, people will tell me the theory is so obvious that I've got some nerve claiming to have discovered it. Well, you point, it's obvious. Well, you battle that. Well, okay. The main thing, though, is that it works. That's the main strength it has. It does actually work. Um, I'm going to give you an example now. Um, go pets. Anybody heard of Go pets? Yeah, a few people heard of Go pets. This was a um, 2005 casual world out of Korea. And the designer, Eric Bethke, knew about player types and thought, well, there's a lot more of these people in the socializer quadrant than there are in any others. So we're going to hit those socializers hard. And they created this game, and it, in his words, carpet bombed the social quadrant. So everything was aimed at socializers. And they got loads of socializers as a result. And they did quite OK. But there was some Achiever content that sort of snuck in. There was a tree. And if you stood under the tree and didn't move for an hour, a nut fell on the floor. So then you had a nut. Nobody else had a nut. You had a nut. The only way to get that nut was to stand under a tree for an hour. Look at this. I've got a nut. You want a nut? You stand under a tree for an hour without moving. Maybe you can get a nut. It was Achiever content. And they noticed that some people would indeed stand underneath a tree for an hour to get a nut. And they correctly identified that as Achiever content. So I thought, well, let's add some more Achiever content. Even though the game's, like, trawled for socializers, there are a few Achievers in there. Let's give them some content. So they gave them some content and doubled their revenue in seven days. Turns out there weren't many achievers, but each individual achiever was 44 times more profitable than each individual socializer. And their explorers turned out to be 64 times more profitable than the socializers. So there weren't so many of them, but they were willing to pay, and they did. So by applying the player types theory, by saying you need a, a range of types, they improved their income. Um, even the socializers, more socializers came along because the game was more vibrant. There was more to talk about. That person over there is, what kind of an idiot stands under a tree for an hour to get a nut? You can buy a nut. Look, I bought a nut. Yeah, well done. Um, as a historical note, uh, Go Pets was bought by Zynga in 2009. About three or four days later, it was closed down and Zynga opened Petville, which is pretty much the same as Go Pets. Anyway, so that's an, just an example of me boasting, um, showing that uh, the player type theory does work. Um, it's been successfully applied elsewhere, too. Mainly MMOs, because that's what it was meant for, but also in other areas. Um, it's been used in website design by Amy Jo Kim for, I think she first started in about 2000, so many years. Great results. If you, if you design your webs, assuming you've got these four different player types, you will get more traction, more players, more income than if you don't. It's also been adopted for many other types of ongoing game, not just MMOs. Um, it's been used for gamification. God knows why, but it has. Um, been used for face-to-face role-playing games. Been used for casual games. Um, and some way-out crackpot areas like neuro-linguistic programming. There's a book which has all about how to hypnotize people, which has got um, the Bartle types in there as a, one of the ways that you can figure out how to get them, I mean, how to um, give them therapy. So it has been applied in really quite off-the-wall areas. Um, now, an important thing about player types is that it's a theory. Um, it's not just a statistical analysis. So it's not like you just asked a bunch of people what they thought, got the results, and said, okay, there's like four types, and those, there they are. There is actually a theory underneath it that explains it all. Um, luckily for you, I'm not going to explain that theory. 
because then I'd be here for two hours and you'd be here for about 10 minutes. Um, but it does link to other theories, um, generally accepted ones, to do with identity, uh, to do with cognition. So you can have some kind of confidence that it's not just made up. It does actually have some basis in psychology. Um, not all other theories, though. Um, if you're a PhD student wanting to uh, try to map it onto Myers-Briggs, you are wasting your time. You will get a PhD for having wasted your time, but nevertheless, you are wasting your time. It does not map onto that. Um, there are lots of things it doesn't map onto, but that's the main one people try. So, it's pretty good. It's got a theory. What's not to love? Well, unfortunately, the theory only explains why people play MMOs for fun. It does not explain why people play non-MMOs or play not for fun. And it doesn't explain why people who aren't playing at all might use it. So I've got a theory that explains these player types, but it doesn't apply to what a lot of the uses are. There's no reason why it should apply to anything other than virtual worlds. So if you're applying it to something other than virtual worlds, then you might want to prick your ears up. Um, this is a hammer and a screw. That's actually my hammer and my screw as well, and my block of wood. Um, so, some social game designers, casual game designers, they know that it's got a theory, but hey, it, it works. Let's apply it anyway, let's get some results. Maybe it'll work for us. And they don't really care that um, the theory doesn't apply because it's like some magic formula. It, it'll either work or it won't work. So it's like someone thinking, hmm, psychoanalysis, that's, that's pretty good, that works on people. Maybe I should apply it to plants, because if it works on people, maybe it'll work on plants. And they, then they try to psychoanalyze the plants, and the plants never say anything, oh, damn introverts. And so they think, oh, this is no good, and they pull out and say, well, this is a stupid theory, it doesn't apply to plants. Well, it's not supposed to apply to plants. But then there are other people who apply it to animals. And whether they get any success or not depends on, uh, I guess, how um, gullible the, the animal's owners are. But there are some successes. So you can think, well, maybe there are ways I could stop dogs biting people using human-based psychoanalysis. So maybe there is something there, but there's no real reason why it would work on dogs. It just maybe does. So with player types, that's the gamble you're taking. Will it work or won't it work when there's no reason why it should? And we find out that when you apply um, player type theory to casual games or social games, online social games, you find that it does work. You um, create the content for these particular four types and you marshal the people so that they all get into the right types and they all play the right stuff. And then you analyze it at the end, you give them questionnaires, and you find, well, this is pretty good because we have indeed got four types of players, you know, all the explorers are doing the exploring and everything. And it shows that the theory works. Except it doesn't, because you just herded them into those. If you created something that's only got four types of content, and then you throw people at it, well, you're only going to get the people who like those four types of content doesn't mean the theory worked. All it means is you're really good at herding people into four types. Maybe there are another six types that you didn't know anything about, that you lost the players because the theory's only got limited application. So you can't just say, we'll apply this theory and then uh, test it and it works. Because that's like saying, um, this. Uh, it's like having a, a room with a, a door that's only this high, and anybody trying to get in can't get in unless they're smaller than this. And when they get in, you say, hey, we've got a room of short people. Yeah, well, of course you do. You put the barriers. So you can't create games based on player type theory and then measure it based on having 
force people to play in those types, that's, that's not good. Still, um, gets me uh, consultancy gigs, so I can't complain too much. Um, so that's one way that people apply player types theory out of the MMO like comfort zone. Um, some people know the theory, they know um, that they're applying it beyond its limits, and yet they see reasons why it might work. So they see an analogy between what the theory says and what they're, they're looking for. So they might think, well, these guys are thinking a bit like achievers. So perhaps some of the player type theory would work because that's got achievers in it. And sometimes this does seem to be useful. Sometimes when you do that, so long as you remember it's an analogy, it does work. So um, in the old days, they used to teach um, electricity by using um, a water model. So they'd get like all these soft tubes and little valves and things and saying these valves are a bit like um, switches. And then uh, this, where the tube gets wider, that's well, like, well, maybe if when the tube gets narrower, that's like resistance, let's put it that way. Um, and so they build all these things out of water and say, if you can follow that, how that works, you know, in parallel and in series and so on, you can understand it. Um, and that's fine as an analogy, except with electricity, when you cut the wire, the electricity doesn't all flow out and go all over the desk. But with water, it does. So the analogy's got limits, but as long as you keep within the limits, it's fine. So it is here. As long as you stay within the limits of the analogy, it's going to work. The danger is when the analogy becomes identity. So you stop treating it as if it was an analogy, start treating it as if this actually applied 100%. Because then you suddenly stop designing whatever you were and start designing an MMO. So an aeroplane is like a big bird, but it isn't a big bird. It's just like one. You can treat it like a big bird in many ways, but if you think it really is a big bird, no, it's not going to lay eggs or lie drunk on a chair. Um, the other uh, popular use or misuse, I should say, of player type theory is bandwagon. The bandwagon approach is where um, people read the thing and say, oh, four player types, and that's all they read. So they know that these four player types, and everyone else is using them, we'll use them too. Because if it doesn't work, well, everyone else has failed. If it does work, we'll be left behind, so we'd better just do it. So they do it without any understanding of the theory. Um, we see this in gamification. Um, gamification is the attempt to use game um, design principles for non-games. It's the sort of thing which can work, particularly if you're trying to get somebody to do something they already want to do, but it's got a limited shelf life um, for, for other applications. Um, player type theory is being picked up by many gamifiers and is being used um, as a gamification thing. Now, one of the things that you do um, with gamification is you give people rewards for stuff. So they do something, you give them badges and points uh, and leaderboard positions. So um, as an example, let's say you've got some really bad shoes. You're selling a sh you sell shoes and you've got really bad shoes. You can't get anybody to buy these awful shoes. What do you do? Well, every time somebody buys shoes, you give them some points. And after they've bought 50 pairs of shoes, you let them bear by these special shoes. You know, the ones you can only get with 50 points. The ones you would not want because they're so hideous, but you've got 50 points, you're going to get those shoes because nobody else has got those shoes. There are people who do this. You, uh, you get your points for buying things, and then you get to buy exclusive merchandise. The reason it's exclusive is sometimes because nobody would buy it otherwise. But you've been encouraged to do it using a games technique. Now that's fine. But the problem that we, we're seeing with gamification is people are 
giving you points for other things. So if you're an explorer and you look at all the different parts of the website, you might get some points. Well, that's OK, but what would an explorer want with points? Points are like an achiever thing. Achievers want points. Explorers don't want points. They just want content to explore. If you speak to many other people, if you'd make lots of postings on the uh, website, you get points, and you can swap the points for more shoes. But why would a socializer want points? They want to talk to people. They don't want to be better than other people at racking up shoe uh, um, collections. So people, have, they've read the theory at one level and then just completely misunderstood it at another. So they think that you have to um, have, um, you have to reward these people. You do, but you have to reward them with the rewards they like, not with the rewards that achievers like or that socializers like. Um, the, the theory's use in gamification began as an analogy style um, mapping. So all these people are thinking a bit like achievers and those people are thinking a bit like socialites. Now, where have I heard those two terms before? Aha, maybe if we try this, it might work. So if you follow that, then that's fine. It will, will work. But you've got to adapt it to the, the context. This is like saying something... Um, this is a, a device for making cookies. It's a, it's a shape and I just stamp out the cookies in the pastry. What am I doing over here? Well, I'm making car doors. And to make a car, car door, I need to stamp out bits of metal out of a huge sheet of metal. Well, it's obvious I should use cookie cutters. Oh, not working, is it? Well, no, because you need big co cookie cutters and like a steam-powered machine to do it. So the analogy is fine, but you've got to continue the analogy through, and they don't always do that. Um, when I say they don't always do that, what I mean is the really smart ones do it, but most of them aren't really smart. Um, I think I've just stopped myself from getting invited to any more gamification conferences. <clears throat> um, player type theory was developed for the use of designers, the people who design MMOs. Not many of those people around in the world, but that's for whom it was designed. It wasn't designed for players. It wasn't designed for marketers. It was designed for people who were going to design the games or the worlds. That's what it was created for. That doesn't mean that players can't use it. It doesn't mean that marketers can't use it. It just means that they weren't the people for whom it was made. They might be able to make better use of it, but they weren't the initial target audience. So it may be the wrong tool for the job. It, it's a tool, it does things, but it's not a tool for anybody other than designers. And the users of, the of this tool need to be aware of this. They need to know that what they're about to try and use it for wasn't necessarily created for them to do that. Um, but the reason that most people use this tool is because it's the only one in the box. Um, if you're a game designer, you probably will have come across player type theory. If you've been hauled in to create a game for some social network, then you're going to look in your toolbox and what is there there? Ah, player type theory. I'll use that. It might work. Certainly better than using nothing. Um, but there are other tools in the box. It's not the only one. Um, Nicole Lazzaro has got a uh, pretty good tool um, that she's used, she's tested it many times as you know, psychological testings and you know, wired people up and track their eyes and stuff, and it works pretty well. It maps onto the player types, but it gives you additional depth. It doesn't have a theory behind it. There's no um, theoretical explanation as to why it would work, although it does link back to, um, to Calwar, if uh, there are any of you um, out there who have got an academic background. Probably not, because um, you'd probably be having your afternoon nap if you did. Um, but that's another tool, and it's a more specialised version of the player types tool. Um, this is uh, John Radoff's motivations. 
that's orthogonal to the uh, player types. So that means that you can use this and player types at the same time. Um, there's no um, conflict between the two. And what he's got here, he's got um, qualitative gameplay and quantitative, and then few players and many players. And so there's all these different things, immersion, cooperation, competition, and achievement. Well, that's good if that's what you're looking for. But you need to think, what am I looking for? Um, few of these uh, approaches have any theory explaining why they would work. They're based on observations. So we can be confident that they're saying something true, but we don't really know why they're saying it, just that what they're saying maps out. If we don't know why they're saying it, then that makes it a lot harder to use them. It doesn't mean you can't or couldn't or shouldn't use them. It just means you've got to be careful in using them because you don't know what it's going to do. Um, just because an idea makes sense, that doesn't mean that you should always apply it. Uh, Radolf's types apply to any game, but what you need to think of before you use it is what do they mean for your game. Just, be just because they apply doesn't mean they're useful. Same with player types. Just because player types apply doesn't mean that they're going to be useful to, to you. There are many ways you can partition a player base. Um, trivially, you can say male and female. There. All, play, all players can be um, divided into two groups, male or female. Yeah. So. And that's what you've got to ask yourself. So. So what? I know that they can be divided into male or female, but what does that buy me? Um, I know they can be divided by age. I know they can be divided by country. I know they can be divided by language. But what, do they, what does it buy me? What does that tell me that I, I need to know when I'm creating a game? Hmm, maybe we should make them for left-handed people and right-handed people because they're like two kinds of people. And some of them are women and some of them are men. So this is a game for left-handed women. Yeah, okay, but is that really buying you anything? You need to understand what the theory is saying, why it's there, and what that means for you. So, you have to ask yourself two initial questions when you're considering game design tools, by which I mean theories. What is it that I want to do, and what will help me do that? So you're creating a game, what is it you want to know? Why is nobody playing this game? How can I get more people to play this game? What will help me do that? Will this theory help me do that? It might tell me something perfectly true about my game, but will it actually help answer my question? You shouldn't be asking, what can I use this tool for? Well, wow, player types, that's pretty good. What can I apply that to? MMOs, that's what you can apply it to. You shouldn't be asking, which is the best model? It's fine to say which is the best model for this particular project I'm working on, but not which is the generic best model. That's like asking which is the best tool in my toolbox at home. The drill. Because you can make holes in things. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay, but maybe it, sh it should be something else. Maybe it should be the saw, because then you can, like, chop things up. Ah, what the noise. Yeah. Tools are for specific jobs. There's no best tool. There's only a best tool for your job. To do the above, to make these decisions, you need to understand what it is the model is telling you. Oh, I keep making explosive noises into the microphone. I hope. Um, as an example of a, uh, a tool, um, Nick Yee, uh, an ex... Um, He's a researcher in Stanford, Stanford University. And he questioned 3,200 MMO players and found 10 basic motivations. 3,200 is approximately 200 times the number of people PhD students normally seem to uh, interview. Um, so his uh, results are probably a bit safer than some of the ones you might read about, um, assuming you were to pick up minor conference uh, proceedings. Um, 
seven of these uh, types that he found um, match the eight type model for, of player types, which I didn't show you, but that's the one that underpins my player types there. It's got eight types. Um, seven of the things that Nick found um, matched that because one of them conflated two types. The remaining three that he had concern immersion, where immersion is the sense that you are in the virtual world. That's immersion. That's what people mean when they say immersion. How much do I feel that this character is me? Um, now, there isn't a player type for immersion. Um, in the full theory, full two hour long theory, I can explain where immersion fits. Immersion is, um, emerges from how far you progress through player types, because play, people don't stay in the same type forever. They gradually change between types. In fact, we knew they changed before we knew we had types, which is bizarre, but that's how the case, that's how it works out. So, um, emergence is a measure of your progression through player types. So the theory covers it, but not as a player type. And the reason for that is because you can be immersed and an explorer at the same time. Whereas player types itself is, um, you're only ever really one type, either moving away from another or towards another, but you're really basically only one type at once. So Nick Yee's categories overlap. You can be immersed and an explorer, and that's fine, because his model is for social scientists. He built his model for the use of social scientists. They want to know how best to partition the user base so that when they're asking questions about people, they've got some handle on what sort of um, knowledge, opinions the individuals are likely to have. So if you were a social um, scientist, you would just use Nick Yee's model. You wouldn't bother with anybody else's. That's the right tool for the job. But if you're a games developer and you see Nick Yee's model, all oh, right, yes, well, we'll use that. Well, that's, that's okay, but it isn't actually a model. It's, um, it's a statistical analysis that says we've found these clumps of commonly held views. Okay, you've found them, but what does that mean? Well, to a social scientist, that's the question that you're going to use it to answer. To a game designer, as soon as you start saying, well, it means we need to create games for this, now you're interpreting it in ways it wasn't meant to be interpreted. Let's create games which give you points for immersion. Uh, you, no. It's, as soon as you start adding those kind of levels on, you're, you're, you're inventing a theory to fit the data. The data wasn't there for your theories. It was there for social scientists to build theories. So Nick's typography is fine if you read what he's written and not just grab the type names from a summary. But people being busy, you know, they don't want to spend too long reading these things. They'd much rather spend six months developing a game based on a misunderstanding of a theory than 15 minutes reading the theory first. Uh, that's what they do. So there are people who've read Nick's thesis and have gone and tried to develop games based on there are these types. But they're having to add their own interpretation based on, on, on nothing other than their own gut instinct, really. There's, not, there's nothing there. Now, if you've got a good gut instinct, that's maybe all you need. But there's no, there's no reason why what you're doing should apply. It's more like a catalyst. Than, um, than a seed around which things can, can grow, can accrete and get bigger. Some typographies are not fine. You, quite often um, you'll find people who uh, you know, the 10 types of gamer and they'll have things like you know, lurker and, uh, and, and whales and stuff. And you, yes, you can have all these, but then you can think, well, hold on, these aren't 10 types because I can be a lurker and a whale at the same... Well, I, I can't be a whale because I'm not paid enough, but I could be if I were paid enough, both a lurker and a whale, and any number of these things. There's just what people have just spotted and uh, you know, written a little piece about it. And again, that's okay as information, but it's not something upon which to base uh, any, any investment of money. 
Um, player type theory has been around for so long that uh, some people feel that it's quite tired. It's, a, it's an old theory, you know, it's a bit like um, Newtonian physics. Don't really apply anymore. You know, who needs gravity? Um, and so they'll have um, a notion of their own, some idea of a model of their own. So um, they'll try to introduce it. And that's great. I really, really want to see player types superseded. I want to see a new theory. I want people to try player types out and break it. Because if they break it, they'll understand why it broke. And if they know why it broke, then they can fix it or write something else that's better. And if we've got a better theory, we get better games. And that's what I want, better games. So I really want to have a better theory because we get better games. Unfortunately, as yet, we haven't got a better theory, which is very frustrating. Um, most new models are far worse than player type theory. They're ill-conceived, they overlap, they say the same things as other, others. Um, it, because player types is only, uh, says everybody is one type, it, that, that's, that's really easy to find a, um, a counter position because to, to disprove it you just have to find somebody or some type of player which it, which doesn't fit the bill. So anybody who plays MMOs for fun should be one of those four, well, actually eight types in the full model. And if they're not, then it doesn't apply. And I read papers where people will say, well, this guy here, you don't have any of these people, they're called discoverers. Well, I do, it's just that I call them explorers. Or you get, well, your theory doesn't apply to, uh, to gold farmers. Well, it's not supposed to. It only applies to people who play for fun. So I get all these people trying to break it, but they're not taking the right... They, they, I want it to break. I don't want it to be mis misunderstood. Um, as an analogy to what goes on, people go out and they'll ask questions of users, 16 of them, and they'll find out what the people think they're playing virtual worlds for. What are you playing? Why do you play the, these games? And the people give them answers. And an analogy, it's like asking drivers the five things they want most in a used car. I just did that earlier. There's those, that, question, that slide, the top five things that people want in a used car. And they'll say things like upholstery. I want leather seats because I'm French and we want leather seats in France. I want a sound system because, hey, I want to be able to have no, un, no impression of any other vehicles around me so I can knock people off their motorcycles. They'll go for air conditioning, sat nav, all these things, that's what they want. The number, the top five things they want in cars. They don't mention things like the engine. Some of them, though, they do mention the engine. They may say, I want the engine size. But they don't say it for the same reasons. So even if they're saying, yeah, I want a car with... Uh, and the engine size is important to me when I'm buying a new, uh, sorry, a, a second-hand car. It might be for different reasons. So a van driver might want a big engine because they're carrying around meter cubes of metal in the back, washing machines or something. So they want a powerful engine because if it's too weak, they can't move things. And if they're teenagers, they might want a powerful engine so that they can go really fast and impress speed cameras. Um, salespeople, people who spend their whole lives driving around in cars, want they, to look at the engine size because they, the, if it's too powerful, it's going to use too much fuel. They don't want to use lots of fuel because they're driving the whole time. They want an engine that's going to be fuel efficient. So even when um, you get people who say the same thing, they can say it for different reasons. And the worst thing is, they never mention the brakes. But if you're buying a used car, you really, really want brakes. But nobody ever mentions brakes. And it's like this with um, when you ask players in, a, in um, questionnaires, what do you want from a games? They will tell you all these things, 
and miss the really important things they really do want because they just assume that that's part of the definition of what a game is. And then when you write up your theory, it doesn't mention, oh, gameplay. So people will play different games for the same reason. So they might play a range of games all for the same reason. They like resource management games. Or they might play the same game for different reasons. Like with MMOs. Everybody plays MMOs for reasons, but socializers, achievers, killers. What was the other one? <laughs> they play for different reasons, but it's the same game. So you can't, just by asking a few, get a comprehensive answer. You've got to start prodding them. And as a result of, of many questionnaires, we get all these different player type theories and they, they don't tell you anything useful. It's, they, they just tell you what the popular answers are. Um, then they moan when you don't give them the things that they were expecting, like critical things like gameplay. So if you give them a game based on this, these, the, the wrong theories, you're going to get um, omissions in the answers. And the classic example um, is that whenever you ask players what kind of games they want, they always say they want new, original games, and then they go out and buy one that's got a number at the end. Call of Duty 17. So they say one thing and then do another. So you can't actually trust them anyway. <clears throat> if you're thinking of applying player type theory or any other theory to your games or to your website or hypnotherapy practice, then you should figure out the problem to which this is the solution. What, is, what problem is it that I'm trying to solve that I'm going to use this for? Is this problem actually a problem or is it just something that's arised because I happen to know about player type theory or whatever other theory you're applying? Is player types actually a solution? It might point me in the direction of a solution. It might be better than nothing, but is it actually a solution? Or am I just using it because it's there? Look at other possible solutions. And if you misapply it, don't blame the theory. You can blame it, the theory if you misapply it, if um, you apply it properly. But in MMOs, um, that means you can blame the, the theory, uh, the player type theory. But you can't blame the player type theory if it doesn't work for non-MMOs. And the same applies for any other model. You can't blame it if it's not meant to be applied and it doesn't work. Um, this is my last slide. So, player type theory is like a hammer. It's the best thing for hammering nails into wood. If you've got out a nail and it needs to go into wood, the hammer's what you're going to use it is not as good as a screwdriver for putting screws into wood. But if you don't have a screwdriver, it's going to be better at putting screws into wood than your bare hands. And this is kind of where we are with player type theory, applied to um, casual games or social games. It's like hitting a screw into wood with a hammer. It's going to do the job but you really need something else. The trouble is we don't actually have that something else. We've got some other tools, but they're like, well, okay, I'll just hit it into the wood with a drill. Well, you can do that as well, but it's still not a screwdriver. You need to, uh, when I say you need to, <laughs> researchers at universities need to spend five years begging for money to be able to figure out what to do. How you're supposed to, what's the, the answer to this question? It might be there isn't a tool. Just because everybody else is using something, that doesn't mean that that's um, the only reason you should use it. Uh, it might be that everybody else is making a mistake. Um, I was going to say something about the, uh, the bad weather in London, but then I realised Trip Hawkins had got caught in it, so perhaps I, I shouldn't. Um, whatever you do... Um, if you're going to apply any kind of theory, whether it's player types, whether it's one you've read in a book, 
whether it's one on a website, Gamma Sutra or somewhere like that, or whether it's something that's been proposed by somebody working for you, you've got to read the theory. You've got to understand what, what it's supposed to do. So if it works, you'll know why it works. If you know why it works, then you no longer need the theory. You've got a, the understanding of what it's being applied for. And if it has no theory, it's just a list of different types with um, some scientific validation as its to existence, but no explanation as to why it's there, well, you can still use it, but it's an act of faith. There are 17 different types. Somebody's done the analysis, found these 17 different types. I'm going to go with that. I've no idea why it's going to work, but it's an act of, of faith. And that's pretty well what you're, you're with at that point. And that's all really I've got to say. Player types or any theory, apply it. Yeah, fine, but know what you're doing, know what you're applying, and don't get too upset if it doesn't work. Right, that's it. Thank you very much, Richard. We've got some time for questions. Questions for the audience? I was curious when you talked about um, MMOs. Mm. How do you classify an MMO? How do I classify an yeah. MMO? Yeah, when you were, when you said, you said the player yeah. type theory is great for MMOs. Yeah. Describe an MMO. Okay. Well, I got three answers. The first one is buy my book. The answer's in there. And the name of the book is? Uh, Designing Virtual Worlds. But you're not going to buy it, you're just going to get it off um, Torrent. <laughs> the, the second thing I can say is an MMO is anything directly descended from Mud One, because that makes me look good. And the third thing I can say is an MMO is anything which has a self-contained physics, is real time, is a shared world in which you are a player who um, controls an individual, an avatar, um, and it's not reality. Um, I think there's probably a sixth one that I've missed out. But basically, that's a, a, an MMO. A shared multiplayer world that you can descend into that's got its own um, automated physics system that you uh, control through a conduit called a character or uh, that maps onto a character. That's an MMO. And there are lots of them around, but there are lots of things that aren't MMOs. I've had people try to persuade me that Facebook is an MMO. It's not. No physics that I've noticed. No physics, no avatars. Um, it, yes. Any other questions? She's so fast. I like this one. Can you come to Seattle? If, if you've seen a casual or social game where it happens to work well, if you can make an example where, you know, by chance it happened that it seemed to well, work, one of the... The trouble is, people who apply it aren't going to um, say, thank you, Dr. Bartle. Your theory worked for my game because then they feel they should be giving me some money. So, although I know there's plenty of games out there that use this, because I read them the whole time, read about it the whole time, and people um, try to get me to come and tell them about things, the main success ones, I have no idea which ones use it and which ones don't. It might be that all the really successful ones don't use it. That would be kind of ironic. But I do know that people who work on the, um, the main, like Zynga titles, are aware of player type theory and have used it in the past. I know, for example, that Raf Costa is a big um, user of player type theory and he's currently at um, the Disney sub, um, subsidiary, what was that play something or other, something play, God knows. And, and so that um, player type theory has, has it informed what he's done? Well, I'll have to ask him. But it's certainly not going to be um, broadcast from the, you know, top of the roof that um, player types were successful in here because if it has been successful, they don't want anybody else to know. In fact, maybe if you do hear it being broadcast, that's the reason not to use it because they're trying to trap you into using a failed system. All I can say is um, GoPets was the, the, was the example I gave because the designer there was 
happy to talk about it at GDC. Um, not quite so happy he got bought out and shut down by Zynga, but still, um, he was quite happy to talk about it. So that was all right, but you don't see that so often. So can I give you uh, a game? No, I can't. There might be none, and then it might be all of them. That wasn't a good answer, was it? <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? Is it always the explorer type that spends the most cash in games, in MMOs? No. Um, it depends on the game. You see, the reason that people buy things depends on what their player type is. Uh, and they won't buy things which um, they would regard as cheating. Well, actually, they would if they could get away with it. Um, let, let's put it this way. Um, so, if you're an achiever, you don't like it if other people can buy success, because that makes you look an idiot. Why, here I've spent all this time doing all this stuff, and then somebody else can just buy it, so that really undermines my achievement. I want to be able to show off to other people how good I, how I, how I've achieved. And so, I don't want other people to be buying things. Of course, if I'm not actually as, all that good, I might sneakily buy something, as long as they can't tell that I've bought it. But really, I don't want to be anything being bought that makes it look as though our other people are better players than they are. So they're not interested in that. Socialisers don't care. Socialisers are interested in other people. And they see no problem in buying something which gives them a gameplay advantage because they don't regard gameplay as being important. What they regard as important are um, contacts between players. And they would be really upset if, the, um, if you could buy friends. So they spend ages trying to build a social network, they've got all these friends, and then somebody else comes in and says, I want to buy your guild. I'm now your guild, leader of your guild. You bow down before me. They would be really upset by that. An achiever wouldn't care. Achievers don't care who runs the guild so long as they get into the raid at the right time. But socialisers would really care. So. What counts as cheating um, depends on who's on the, the, the type of the player who's doing the, um, the purchasing and the type of the player who's looking at it. If you've got a game that's got lots of achievement in it, played mainly by socialisers, then I would expect the achievers would spend more on achievement things than the socialisers would on socialiser things because that enables them to be head and shoulders away ahead of, above everybody else. But if this game got lots of achievement in it, then I wouldn't expect them to do that because they can get the achievement other ways. So it, it depends on the type of game um, as to which one's going to be the most um, um, cost-effective. Explorers will typically pay quite a lot because they want to find out how things work. Uh, and if that means buying access to individuals or buying access to content, then they'll do that if that content is itself something they deem worthy of looking at. But an explorer would get really upset if there was a website which just told you everything and you just had to pay a few dollars to go onto it because that's completely undermined their, um, their exploring. Uh, so they would be annoyed by that, whereas an achiever would just go on it because they want to know where, the, where to find the datacrons in Star Wars The Old Republic. So it, it really depends on the type of game um, and, uh, and the balance as to which ones are going to be the, mo the most. But I would expect, in general, explorers would pay more than achievers, and achievers would pay more than um, explorers, sorry, than um, socialisers, and killers would probably cost you more uh, in the short term um, but in the long term you do need some of them killers are a bit like um, when you're eating something and it tastes bland you think I'll just put a bit of pepper on and now it tastes better you just don't want the whole pepper pot to go on because then it tastes horrible so you just need a little a few killers not a lot of killers but yeah. All right, does. I think we have time for one more. Hi, 
Hi. Hi. Uh, on a couple of occasions, you uh, talked about gamification. Yeah. And um, I couldn't quite put my finger on your opinion on it. It seemed uh, on occasion that you were fond of it, and then on occasion that you were almost making fun of it as... Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, gamification. <laughs> yes, please. Yes. Um, it can work really well, but in, in bespoke solutions to particular problems. As a general one-size-fits-all, it works miserably. Um, and unfortunately, it's the general one-size-fits-all which is being wheeled out at the moment. If you've got a particular problem and you want to gamify it, then getting a game designer to help do that, you probably would get a good solution. But if you're trying to apply some off-the-shelf gamification thing to your problem, it probably isn't going to work. It might work in the short term, but um, it's a bit like uh, loyalty points with cards. You know, you, you buy something in the supermarket, you get a bunch of loyalty cards. That started out as gamification. Nowadays, it isn't because you've got loyalty points from every supermarket. The only reason that you go to a particular supermarket isn't because of the loyalty points, it's because it's close. Uh, the only reason the supermarkets give you the loyalty points is because they want to bribe you to give them their details so they can track your shopping and decide which wine to advertise to you. So that's, it's, it's just basically bribery. Um, once you look at it as bribery, it all makes sense. But for some things, um, like speed camera lottery, look that one up, that's not too bad. That's quite a good idea. And, but it's a bespoke solution to a particular problem. And in that area, 